Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're here to talk about the offense against the Rams. Joining me to do that is Josh Reed. Josh, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ken. Trying to stay warm up here in Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> there you go. Josh just showed me the uh, the snow outside his door. Uh, we don't. We haven't had any snow to speak of here in Baltimore. Maybe about a eighth of an inch or something where I live uh, a night or two ago. But uh, I saw you guys had. Uh, uh, probably half a trash can worth of snow out there in front of your house. Oh yeah, man. If I don't, if I don't shovel it every couple of days, it'll get, it'll get almost waist deep. All right. All right. Well, very good. I, I'm uh, sorry about that, but you are living the life up there in terms of being a, uh, uh, you know, your own, uh, a newspaper reporter up there. I, are, are any sports games getting canceled right now because of the snow? No, no. So there's, there's, there hasn't really been any cancellation due to snow. It's more so due to officiating shortages, shortage of, of officials at the high school level. So like they have a, a crap ton of like high school hockey games that are going to get crammed into the next couple of weeks between now and you know and New Year's just because they had so many games canceled and postponed in the month of November due to the officiating shortage. So it. Uh, People up here are prepared for the snow, man. Um, only time it really gets bad is when the roads get too bad for kids to get to school. All right. All right. Very good. Uh, okay. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the Ravens here and the Rams. I, 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 you know, the excitement around Baltimore in the last day or so has been talking about the the, the possibility of getting the number one seed. There is a, a number two seed, you know, which would be a um, – Better than the three, certainly, but very much a consolation prize. You look at any of the the various models that that project out the rest of the season, whether you're using ESPN or the DeVoe model or whatnot, uh, have the Ravens up pretty close to 60% in terms of their chance to to uh, get that number one seed. Uh, how, where, where do you lie on this in terms of uh, wanting to make sure they get that, get the additional rest as opposed to not being rusty for the game? Um, the, the thing, the difference between this year and the 2019 is 2019 the Ravens had one of the best like health seasons wise that they've had in a long time. And everybody was healthy, you know, just, just, just about, I can't even think of a guy that was really struggling with anything towards the end of that season. Whereas this season you've had both of your starting offensive tackles, which we'll get into tonight, both your starting offensive tackles have dealt with uh, nagging and lingering injuries, Ronnie with his knee and, and, um, and uh, Morgan Moses with his shoulder. And then I think they said that it was like a triceps at one, at one point. And then, then it was a the shoulder thing. So um, when you get, when you get older players, especially with some, with some of these like veteran mercenaries, like a, like a clowny, and Kyle Van Noy and you know even the guy like Arthur Millet who's even though he's year seven still like you know guys who have years into the league you could always use that extra rest and I feel like this team they have the right blend of like maturity and you know like I said also like veteran savvy to where like they won't really come out I feel like they won't come out rusty um you know coming coming off of a, a first round bye and whenever you can play three games to the Super Bowl or I'm sorry two games to the Super Bowl that's that, that's better than than having to uh, go through a gauntlet yeah, it's a it's a much bigger deal. I would agree, and and I, just having the AFC Championship at home is something that uh, season ticket holders deserve. Uh, they've never had it as as uh, you know in all our twenty seven years. So um, it's it's time, and uh, and I hope this is the year the Ravens can get it done. Uh, they'll they they have to not only do they have to get the number one seed, they also have to win a football game to to ensure that it'll be played in Baltimore. Uh, but anyway, I'm 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 all with you. I'm on team bye. And I'm, I'd go further than that. I would love for the team to win three games in a row, which would absolutely seal up the number one seed and then go into the Pittsburgh game with nothing to play for. I think there's multiple reasons why they would prefer to let Pittsburgh into the playoffs with a loss anyway um, that could benefit them. I mean, let's say Buffalo is the alternative to being in somewhere in the playoffs and the Ravens have a chance to eliminate Buffalo by letting Pittsburgh in. That'd be pretty freaking great, I think. Yeah, as much as, as much as fans don't want to, you know, see the Ravens getting swept by Pittsburgh uh, on the on the record, you know, if it, if it keeps a more dangerous team like a, like a Buffalo or even even a Houston, who they might, you know, have trouble with second time around, I think that'd be much more beneficial than than just than just be splitting with the Steelers just for the you know for the sake of splitting with the Steelers. Uh, there's some very good teams who who might have their playoff lives on the line. It's not impossible. Kansas City will be among those. That Kansas City will be a team on the outside if they lose two more games. Um, it's not impossible, obviously, that the, 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 any of the seven and six teams are, are kind of on the outside right now, um, even though Buffalo still, I think, has 
Well, they can still certainly win the East. I don't think they can get the one seed, or at least it's unlikely that they can get the one seed. But they um, they can they can definitely still win the East, and it'd be nice if the Ravens could uh, could keep them out. Buffalo not a super easy schedule the rest of the way, but um, they they uh, uh, are our team. I I genuinely fear in the playoffs, and one of the ones I wouldn't want to see come to Baltimore for uh, for that first game after the Ravens had had a couple weeks off. Yeah, they're definitely a team that you know you know make you sweat, but but also that you know, they they they're just as likely to win the game as uh, to lose the game as they are as they are to win the game as material as they've as they've been this year. But again, you don't want to face that hot team coming off a wild card weekend. Yeah, yeah, I'll uh, I'll buy that. Uh, in terms of crowd noise, this was just a, a a a wonderful game. We talked a little bit about it on the offensive pod. Uh, I did that one solo, but the but this one we uh, we, we want to make sure I, I, I wanted to talk to someone about this. How much of it could come through on the TV uh, to you about just how loud that stadium was? Did the announcers mention it at all? Uh, no, I don't think they mentioned it at all. But you could you could hear it. I mean, you you could hear it on on the TV that way, like that place was erupting every time there was a big play, like when when likely was was wide open down down the left sideline. Everybody was ah. Uh-huh. It, you could you could just you could hear it coming through. I got I, I don't even have a good you know sound system up up, up here um for my TV, but you can still hear it. it, it, it I, I can't I can't wait to for a chance to to experience that one day. So two false starts in the game, uh, each of them potentially noise driven. The crowd is extremely loud. One delay of game at the end that was absolutely enormous, turned third and four into third and nine in overtime that it let him get off the field on Clowney's pressure there uh, on, on third and nine. And that Clowney of uh, noise pressure on third and nine. Mm-hmm. Um, but just a, it was a it was a marvelous game. You we walked out of there, your ears ringing. The stadium was, you know, I, I don't know if I'd say it was half empty, but it was there were a lot of empty seats at the end of the game because it had been raining most of the game. A lot of people hadn't come to start with. But um, what it seemed like to me was the, the stadium was louder because of the reverberation on, you know, concrete and metal as opposed to people who, you know, there might be some physics to it that that they that people uh, when there's more people there, you actually get less noise. Um, that reverberates around the place. But anyway, it's, it's extremely loud. And uh, uh, just one of those games that I'll always remember for that and the magical ending, of course. But uh, uh, you know, seeing the, the – I, I love games where you can really feel the crowd have an impact on it. And there have been a handful in, in Ravens history that really fit that bill. This was one of them. Yeah, that's another that's another benefit of getting the number one seed, man. Like the home field advantage in places like 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 Baltimore and Seattle in their heyday, and even Kansas City to this mm-hmm. day, it's a real home field advantage. And the Chiefs haven't really taken advantage of that this year just because of roster construction problems. But you know, the Ravens are a team that I feel like you know we've, we've seen it. You know, you've experienced it. Can really benefit from having home field advantage. All right. I, in terms of the weather, uh, kind of an optimal day for passing um, was one of the things that that I thought. And we, we came into this with the expectation that it was going to be a high wind game in addition to a wet game. That rain was not going sideways. That rain was you know coming straight down during the game. And um, there were pl- plenty of times where, where it was just intermittent or it was light. It wasn't really heavy. It was very tolerable, actually, in the game. We, we, we wore our rain gear, but, but, uh, but it wasn't a problem at all, really, uh, during the game, which meant that the field conditions were very slippery and the get off for pass rushers was very tenuous. Um, you know, they didn't have the kind of the, the, the fast get off uh, to, to get the pass rush going. It meant the pocket times were extended. It meant the receivers got to the top of the route stem and got to make their move on a defender. And it meant there, there was more opportunity for double moves to really take hold and uh, for jukes at the top of the route to, uh, to really work. I thought it was just a marvelous opportunity set for passing in this game. And of course, both Stafford and Lamar had pretty big days under those circumstances. Yeah, yeah, no, a lot of people expected, you know, a low scoring affair ended up being a, a shootout out there. And um, like, like you said, like the footing was definitely was definitely an issue. Even it even caught Keaton Mitchell a couple of times, man. There are a couple of times where he had some creases where I felt like if he would be able to keep his footing, he might have been gone for a, like a, a chunk run, if not even a touchdown a few times. We've seen that guy, you know, find a hole and explode, explode up field. So, I mean, it kind of kind of kind of bit both ways on that end. But you can just see what so many like like clean pockets that Lamar had. I mean, there are times even with Aaron Donald being not triple blocked on every play, but even times when he was like single blocked or just like double blocked that Lamar was just back to reading the paper at times. Yeah. There you go. Reading the paper, making a sandwich, all of those things. Uh, So an offensive tackle rotation in this game, which was something that the Ravens had not done to this point. 
So they decided they wanted to, I think, what part of the decision here was Ronnie had, you know, had supposedly been a little fresher after the bye anyway. He said the bye week did, did him a lot of good. And the Ravens still said, okay, we still want to rotate you with McCarry a series each in, the, in, in each half. And McCarry ended up playing 14 plays in the game. Um, maybe perhaps to make it more palatable, they also had Falele replace Moses for eight snaps. Also happened to be two series, and they they didn't they weren't out for the same series, or they might have been out once for the same series. I have to look at my actual offensive line charts to uh, uh, to see this. Sorry, excuse me, just hit the microphone there. So they yeah, it looks like they they actually staggered them in the first half and again in the second. So they never had their backup guy in on both sides at the same time. But but uh, but they each had you know one series each half, um, you know in in watching how this is done, I know Stanley you know probably doesn't want to be replaced for a series by McCary and Moses probably doesn't want to be replaced by Falele for, for staffs or maybe they both do but maybe it's even more palatable that they're doing it on both sides and they're saying hey you know I can I can imagine the conversation with Harbaugh calling them both in their office and saying. Hey, you guys, we're, we're working through physical issues here. We want to rotate you through with a with some rest each half. And um, Harbaugh said the the idea from, came from Dallas Andrus. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I was going to get into. Yeah, so it was it was it was him and Joe D kind of came. So they wanted them fresher for like later in the game, and in, in it would end up being overtime, which ended up working in their favor. Like you know, they've given those guys you know some some rest some rest you know here here and there. Like I said, it wasn't like extended periods of time or full quarters or anything like that. It's like I'm I'm all for it. You know, kind of like lessen the wear and tear on them, especially guys have been dealing with stuff for a while especially if you have competent backups and it wasn't like you know like the rams had you know top-notch edge rushers either so they couldn't really take advantage of of, of, of falele's you know greenness you know to to a to a full extent um and you know same 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 on well, patrick mccary's not green but he's just you know not ronnie stanley i know a lot of people have been kind of calling for ronnie's head in um in, in, in recent weeks but um like I said, people people sitting on their couch have no idea what these guys go through, man. And um, you know, like like I, I can barely walk up the stairs like I, with with a knee sprain or whatever. Like let alone try to stop somebody who's like 200, 300 plus pounds, you know, world class athlete trying to you know take my head, take me my quarterback's head off. So um, I I I love to give for people to give Ronnie some more grace because like a lot of time with with Ronnie, man, like those those injuries be freak injuries. Like like those things are like where he gets rolled up on, and I know it happens a lot with offensive linemen, but you 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 never. Never know with the way the weight is distributed, and and you could be you could be going one way, but the momentum of somebody else's weight going another way, and get you, get your knee caught up, and that's what you see just about every offensive line with, with with knee braces on, whether whether they're dealing with something or not, just to you know brace for that potential impact. And mm-hmm. like I said, um, um, I think I think I think rotating with with Ronnie's is way better than 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 just setting him, which some people have been suggesting. I wouldn't want to see Patrick McCarry or left tackle for an entire game if we don't have to. Yeah, I I think it was a reasonable um, intermediate step there to 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 get McCarry on the field, and and it worked out in terms of of uh, I think the play of both backups not torpedoing the Ravens. I mean, I don't think I don't think Falele was great. He gave up half a quarterback hit in eight in eight uh, uh, snaps, but I thought that that uh, you know both of the starters played reasonably well compared to the rest of the year and we'll get into the little, that a little in the second half when we look at the offensive line of course but uh but i thought you know an interesting interesting choice and i'm glad the the ravens are looking at all options on the table to deal with their injuries one of the things about, about getting the buy in those cases is just the the notion of getting an extra week for both of those guys but how about for kyle hamilton you know how about how about you know giving him a week off if he's out for an extended period here it could it could mean a ton uh, to have him back and be fresher. Well, yeah, and that's why I can't stand Twitter doctors sometimes, man. Like they, they, I think I can't stand like Twitter doctors the most is like they'll always project or predict the most worst case scenario, and then like, if they're right, they're like, "See, I told you." And if they're not, well, thank God I dodged the major bullet there. You know, come, you know, there's a report by Jordan Jordan Schultz that it's just a grade one MCL sprain, and it was week to week. And then Harbaugh came out yesterday and said that he's going to be day to day and could potentially even play this weekend against against the Jags. Now. I like as, as much as you know that there, I know you probably got into this in the defense episode, but as much as their secondary and defense as a whole, you know, struggled at at, at times without him on the field. I I'd, I'd rather play it safe and just sit him a game, you know, against against you know what someone reeling Jags team lost two in a row and have their starting quarterback with with a with a high ankle, high ankle sprain. I'd rather sit him for the Jags game 
and you know to make sure that he's good, make sure that knee is stable, you know, because like he's like to me he's been he's been just as if not more integral to this unit success this year more so than even a guy like Rokon Smith, you know, like I know Rokon wears, wears his green dot, but just with everything that Kyle can, can allow this defense to do from a, from a diversity standpoint, from a, from a pass rush standpoint, from a coverage standpoint, it's just way too much, it's way too valuable to, to, to gamble on a Sunday night football game in, uh, in mid December. Right. I would agree with that. And, and it may be that they would even rotate with him. This could be a game where if Hamilton is able to go, that he would only go, you know, a limited number of snaps. I do think it's probably more likely that he might he might sit out even longer than that. But right now, every one of these games is critical, particularly the ones where the Ravens are favored, um, just because they've got to convert a couple of those to be sure of their um, uh, you know division win. I think you know realistically, they probably need they probably only need two and two for either the number one seed or the division. But that means you got to really look at these four games and find out where you can win too because they're going to be they're going to be a underdog against uh San Francisco in San Francisco. And a slight underdog, but still an underdog, maybe a 6 mm-hmm. point 5 point dog something like that. And and there'll be a dog in um uh, sorry, a uh a, you know, a, a favorite against the Dolphins and a Dolphins team that now has piled up with some injuries as well themselves. Um, and they're a small favorite in Jacksonville, about maybe three and a half right now. So in the low 60s in terms of their percentage chance to win. But they don't have, you know, big, beefy chances to win any of these games. And um, even, even if they if they have to go into week 18 and beat the Steelers for that key second win. Uh, and all that assumes the Browns lose a game because the Browns really have to lose one game to, to not lose the division under those circumstances. Um you know, it's it's kind of a lot to ask for. So, uh, you know, I think there is a good chance that that they that they get the one seed with with two more losses. But uh, but it will be a hell of a lot easier if they do if they get three wins and uh, and uh, make it home that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, as much as people want to, you know, poke holes in, in the in the Ravens this year, to me, they've been the most consistent AFC team by 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 far i mean you, you look you look at miami just look, look at what miami did the other night i mean like like not only have they yet to be the team with the winning with the winning record they lost to a team that was reeling in the in the titans in four and eight i mean as much people want to talk about the ravens you know 14 point blown 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 fourth quarter leads the titans i mean the titans literally are utterly collapsed in the in the last few minutes of the game i remember i was on the phone with my cousin i ended up just like flipping back over to the giants and and uh, I, I wanted to flip over to the Giants and, uh, and backwards game, but that game was over. So I was like, oh, man, I guess I got to watch the end of this game. The Tigers just imploded. And then the Dolphins returned the favor and imploded tenfold over. I mean, mm-hmm. two, one, two minutes and 40 seconds, and you let them, you let them score 14 points. I mean, who, who does that? You know, so that was a yeah. That, yeah, yeah, 15 points. You know, so that was something people would, would, were, were dragging the Ravens for the, for the past, you know, two and a half years. And now they're, they're finding ways to finish more consistently down the stretch where other teams like the Dolphins are not only, not only losing players, they lost their starting center for the year to Torres torn ACL. And, you know, uh, then you got Tyreek dealing with an ankle injury and you already got some other, you get lost Jalen Phillips. They're losing pieces and playing inconsistent. And the Ravens are gaining pieces and getting healthier and being becoming more consistent. Who, who so, got lost I'm, on the defensive side for Miami? Didn't Baker get, get knocked out at some so, point? So, and, so, so Baker's hurt, Holland's hurt, and, Holland's uh, hurt. and, and, J, and Jalen Phillips is out for the year with torn Achilles. Mm-hmm. And that happened several weeks ago. So that's, yeah, that's, I meant the new one that, that happened in this game. I, I, it, Holland yeah, was, it was yeah, Holland, Holland didn't play in this game. He was injured a couple couple games back, okay. and then they lost their starting center. He to a torn ACL. Um, uh, that's what what they what they uh, McGovern. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, you know, this is what, the other thing about that game is great math game for football to have the two point strategy down eight used, and then that come back to to actually win the game. It's such a it's such an unusual occurrence, but I will say. This is what I use to determine if a uh, go for it sheet is co- sorry go for two sheet is correctly parameterized. Is look in that minus eight towards the end of a football game and see if it says point thirty eight is the break even probability of going for that. So that point thirty eight means if you have at least a thirty eight percent chance to to make your two point conversion, then you do that. It could say point thirty nine too. It's thirty eight point two is actually the break even point if you if you work it out mathematically, and. To, to me, to, to have that happen, and now people, oh, it's the new math. Yeah, we've known this for years, but you know, but, but you know, coaches just implementing it. I mean, the, the, the truth of the matter is, I've been ridiculed 
for bringing that up before. It's old math. It's been around 2001. You know, Brian Billick did in a game against the Packers um, in in uh, Green Bay, and and uh, the, the Ravens didn't end up getting the ball back to try and win the game, but they but they tried the two point conversion appropriate. He's the only one who did it over like a 20 year period. So I, I just. I want to point out, you didn't know all this time, <laughs> you know, all you people out there. It was the correct play, and it's and, and when you see it done, um, it, it'll it'll be the correct play when when the Ravens have to do it again too. Yeah, I mean, we just saw what Monday night when when the, when the Packers scored, they try and they tried to do go go for the two there to get themselves a three point lead late in that game and couldn't couldn't convert there in that situation and end up costing him in, in the end. Big, big exchange of two-point conversions in the Ravens game as well towards the end. Of course, first of all, they stopped that two-point conversion on that very weird challenge that we need to talk about. What the heck is Harbaugh doing? Touchdown pass. First of all, it's an obvious touchdown. There's, there's nothing to review. There's nobody nobody in that headset could have said, oh, boy, you better take a look at that because it looks like so, Marcus Robinson didn't catch the football. So he he said after he said after the game or maybe maybe it was it was Monday that you know he wanted to he was going to burn a timeout anyways to make sure they were aligned up in the in the right thing because they knew the Rams were going for two they wanted to see what the Rams were gonna gonna um gonna go roll out for two point conversion and then you know just you know call a timeout anyways he was gonna burn a timeout anyways so I don't know like might as well throw a challenge flag but I, I don't know I didn't agree with that either I was like there's dude that thing was clear and obviously a, a, a touchdown what are you trying to take a D Rob's touchdown. I didn't. I didn't have any um, problem with the timeout. Period. I thought there might have been a penalty associated with this. I remember Jim Swartz got flagged once on a Thanksgiving game, but throwing a flag for Detroit and helped them lose a game. They pretty much had won uh, because of. I think it was on Thanksgiving. Maybe I'm remembering incorrectly. It might have been a might have been a different you know week of the season. But uh, but he threw a challenge flag when no challenge was allowed, and that ended up being being a flag. Well, this is you know a challenge is thrown. Um, the the most interesting thing I've heard, which I wouldn't put beyond Harbaugh, and he's not telling you this part of it. This is the part he's leaving out, is that somebody told him, go ahead and challenge the play anyway. Maybe they'll give you an extra minute, and that'll give the Ravens defense a little extra time to think about how they want to react to what they saw initially out of the Rams. And so th- this would have been a uh, you know a, a little opportunity to give McDonald a little little time absolutely critical two-point conversion um and the ravens got it stopped and if you think about what harbaugh has done on special teams in particular over the years some of these game ending holding penalties on punts and things like that uh in the super bowl for that matter you know having the entire team basically tackle the other you know it's it's not beyond him to to try something like that yeah, yeah, yeah. No, man. I mean, like he's he's got a bag of, bag of tricks there, and a lot of people were coming for him for for him with the, for his uh, clock and game management. Um, my 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 question my question is about that whole about that whole you know clock management thing was kind of towards the end of the first half. Um, when they when they had some when they had like what two timeouts to burn and and then they were just like kind of like running running hurry up stuff and I was like okay you have time to take a timeout here it's almost like they were made up in their mind that they wanted to kick a field goal no matter what and weren't going to try to put it in the end zone because there was opportunities where you didn't have to I think was it after the like the, they they it was before they called like I mean the clock had stopped before they called that screen to to uh to Nelson Aguilar I believe I, I was talking to somebody about it on, on Twitter you're going back and to I, quarter I, two I, now right. Yeah, yeah, and in, in, in the quarter two, that um, that the, mm-hmm. the, their field goal drive, and I think there was like either incomplete pass or like somebody went out of bounds, and they had they you know they had they had time, and um, yeah, they, that was only that was only clock management stuff that I kind of questioned. Yeah, so you're right. So it was second and ten with forty seconds left. They threw a one yard pass that made it third and nine, and then they let the clock burn down to eighteen seconds at the seventeen yard line, rather than try and get a first down there. And they still had that would have only been their second time out there, so they could have maybe had thirty four seconds on the clock to work with. I would agree. I think that's a that's a real questionable call, and I don't think there was a lot of danger that the Rams are going to try and move the ball and try and kick a field goal if they'd have left them, you know, twenty eight seconds, say. Um, yeah, or and even if you were. Time. Yeah, and even if you were scared, like oh, third and long, you don't want to, do, you know, the afraid of the pass rush. I'm like, okay, outside of Aaron Donald, who are you afraid of on the pass rush on this team? Now they had a defensive lineman, um, was a uh, Brown, who was, you know, was getting put applying some pressure mm-hmm. for the most part. Like you know, especially in, but Morris has been excellent in two minute, two minute situations. Mm-hmm. I mean, the guy gets the ball quick, he's decisive with this thing. So like, like I'd rather, I'd rather give him a chance to read the field on third and nine. 
then or, or, or whatever ended up being then this throw 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 a screen um and and, and hope for the best so uh, you know that that was just one that I, that, that kind of stuck in my car a little bit and let's then juxtapose that with what happened at the end of the game and not the end of the game at the near the end of regulation so the ravens uh were down 5 28 to 23 to the Rams after they stopped the two point conversion that would have put them up seven. They drove the length of the field and um, uh, did so in a way that they were not trying to score and get that game over in close proximity to each other. And in a way that really bothered me, they had lots of opportunities to run the football on early downs and try and burn some additional clock. Nelson Aguilar ran out of bounds on a play that I thought was, come on, stay in bounds. The jet sweep that they ran to Mitchell, they were almost lucky that he got taken out inbounds for a loss of one maybe on the yeah, play. Yeah, minus, minus one, yeah. yeah. But but that was destined to be a play that runs ends up getting run out of bounds for Mitchell if, if he kind of makes it to the sideline and gains a few yards and, and whatnot. What they really needed there was a – first down and they needed some more time burned off the clock and and you know we were already at the point where the Rams are deciding they wanted to use their timeouts so the Rams were already preparing for getting the football back that alarms should have been going off that you know this is this is not a time to be um leaving a lot of cl- time on the clock very much like Christmas night 20 2016 I don't know if you remember yeah, the game Steelers yes yeah, oh man yeah I was, in college, I was in college man it, it, it killed me yeah. So Juszczyk scored with with 118 to play on a third and one play from the 10 yard line. And I contended for a long time, still do, that, that he should have knelt inside the one or two yard line. And then you take your chances from there. I, I've, I've contacted various people about that. Ross Tucker gave me a couple of, of um, cursory responses to that, which were which were frankly um, uh, dismissive. I will say in terms of, of 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 how they were handled here, but uh, you know you got two risks in that situation. So one is you got the risk you don't score, and the other risk is you score too soon and you leave the opponent a chance to to respond. Both of those risks need to be taken seriously, folks. They're both real risks, and you know Harbaugh's not going to lose his job over over missing in either case. And think about who 2016 Harbaugh is. He's already got a Super Bowl in the bank. He's got tons of currency in the bank with, with, with Bishotti. Bishotti is a hiring authority. He's going to want to listen to, why'd you do it, John? And John's going to tell him exactly why. He's going to say, oh, that makes sense. That's that's how that's, that conversation would have gone, even if he'd have missed it. You know, uh, but it, but it was it was a it was a case where they didn't get into the huddle. There've been obviously other times this year where it didn't get into the huddle with Flowers a couple of times, scoring and on the fair catch. Um, that's that's got to be handled better. And and timing at the end of of regulation here, the Ravens put themselves in a very bad position. They not only did they need to score under under a difficult third and seventeen circumstance or third and sixteen, whatever it was, third but they needed. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then they needed to convert that two point conversion, which remarkable play by both um, uh, Jackson and Flowers to shake free, right on that play, yeah. and and that they needed that to go back up three so that they could defend four down football against Stafford for over a minute. That is a frightening proposition. Four down football on that field on that day of conditions where passing had not been stopped. It's just not something you want to put yourself in a position to do. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, as as hot as Stafford was playing, like like man, like you want to give this guy as least amount of time as possible. I'm not saying he's you know Patrick Mahomes, but you know you give a you give an experienced hot head quarterback you know a, a minute plus. I'm sure sometimes even 59 seconds is enough. I mean, we've seen it several sure. times with, with the rookie, with the rookie like CJ Stroud this year. He's he's done it to several teams this year, but you know, no timeouts and you know, like or a minute or just over a minute or even less than a minute left on the clock, and they can get some get some chunk plays. And because you know, a lot of times it's, it's kind of caution to the wind, and guys are going to be bold. And um, and yeah, as much as your defense was playing strong for the majority of the second half, you just saw them give up a, a extended touchdown drive, and then um, yeah. So I would have like I, I was. I was one of those guys that was kind of clamoring for, you know, more running the ball in, in, in general in the, in the second half just to kind of like slow things down because it just really kind of felt like, you know, two teams just throwing haymakers, you know, 
through through the air in the in the in the pouring rain, and you kind of want to see it. You know, the team was supposed to win that game, kind of take better control of that game and slowing it down and keeping the other team on the sidelines. So maybe they could cool down a little bit. You know, cool that hot offensive down. You know, your offense is hot, their offense is hot, and um, their offense wasn't hot for most of most second half. But when they needed to move the ball and, and get themselves in the scoring position, they were able to move the ball, especially with Kyle Hamilton off the field. They were able to move the ball pretty much at will. And I, I know Mar- Marlon was a little rusty coming first game back after missing, you know, really three weeks because, you know, they had to buy. He missed two games prior to that. But it was just it was it was, it was rough, man. And like I'm not saying the Ravens are, are fortunate to, you know, the way the way the way the game uh, played out the way it did. But, you know, I, I, could, I could also see where they're coming from because there's been time in, in recent years where the Ravens have gotten the ball with, you know, with, with some time left and they kind of ran out of time. And there have been times where we're like, man, if the Ravens, that game would have been a minute long. We feel like the Ravens could have could have did something there. Uh, but, you know, you weren't going against T.J. Watt. Yeah, you're going against Aaron Donald, but you weren't going against T.J. Watt in the banged up offensive tackle with Alejandro Villanueva or, you know, so who uh, you know D.J. Fluker at right tackle. You, know, you had Morgan Moses and, uh, and Ronnie Stanley still much, you know, mostly healthy and, you know, rearing up ready to go in those situations. So I would like to see them run the ball a little bit more, especially on that, especially on that drive. Because like he, it was a, it was supposed to be a four minute drive, but it ended up being a three minute and twenty five second drive. You know, so you really want to see them take all the time off of that clock there, and and the, that so that it's like it's either kind of win and go home. Well, I guess win is yeah. Time. I mean, they they had much more control to exert on the clock in that situation, and and it just you've got to respect your opponent. You've got to look at that thing and say, you know, I guess people. Some people that are my age, and Harbaugh is my age, by the way. He's a year older than me. So he's 61, I'm 60. If he if he remembers the football of his youth, he'll think, well, you know, you always defend the field when you want to. And I'm sure Jack Harbaugh would tell him the same thing in terms of, you you, you know, it's okay to def- try and defend the field and let your defense take care, care of the game. Well, it was okay in the days of Greg Landry as the Lions quarterback or in the games days of Roman Gabriel because completion percentages – were really lower in the NFL. And so four down football wasn't as incredibly successful as it is now and basically unstoppable as it is right now. Uh, Just you've, you've got to take that into account. And in a lot of times, that's the more serious risk, not failing to score. It's it's the it's what the other team is going to do to you afterwards that's that's going to end up costing you the football game. So anyway, a, a a very frustrating end of regulation there for for the Ravens to let that game get tied. I thought, you know, they made actually an enormous play on defense that went unnoticed and went untalked about, but with 44 seconds left, they made a nice inbounds tackle. I think it was for a four-yard gain that knocked off half the clock, took the clock down to 22 seconds, and basically put the Rams in a position where really minimized their their chance for anything but a field goal at that point. They were in field goal range. They had a couple plays left. They, t- they threw the ball into the end zone a couple times, but they, they didn't really have a chance to uh, much of a chance to uh, uh, to get in the end zone at that point. Uh, I just I, I really hate it when when what the opponent is going to do with the ball is not considered in the same light as your need to score as well. Both are important conditions. Yeah, that play you're talking about, it was uh, Adolfo Elway who had the initial, he blown up the plant initially, and then Gino and Roquan came with the, came with the cleanup. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I thought that was like, man, that that might have been a game-saving play right there. But, then, you know, they ended up getting, getting the field goal anyways. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it was um, – yeah, that, that, that was a huge play. I almost wanted to include Adolfo Elway in my Unsung Heroes um, thing, this the article this week. But I, I, the list was already running kind of, kind of long. But that, that play was huge. Yeah. All right, well, let's show, jump on to some of the other uh, offensive comments. We got to pick up the pace a little bit here. I love talking these rabbit holes with you, Josh, but uh, but we got to do that. Out snap seventy three to seventy one by the Rams. Much of that was in the first half. They only had about nineteen offensive plays ran. I think on about their first four or five drives, um, but the defense really played a, a, an excellent second half with eleven points. And you know, from the second half into overtime, they had punt, 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 touchdown. That was the one that put them ahead. And then and then the the field two point conversion. The field goal and the drive that shouldn't have even happened, and then the punt in, in overtime, which was uh, you know an enormous series. So they played excellent football for those last uh, uh, seven drives or so. Yeah, I mean they kind of kind of caught a few breaks on the on the overtime drive with with, with the drops with Davis Allen and I think there were, what two back to back drops. I believe it was on on the on the Rams overtime drive. But yeah, I think the, you couldn't have asked for a better a better response from us, from us as. Out of character, they looked special on that first drive. You know, um, you know. Aaron Rodgers' season is officially over, but yours has just begun at my bookie. NFL, college ball, and a brand new cash out system gives you options to bet and win all season long. 
First two legs of your parlay hit, cash out early and place another bet, or let it ride for a chance at an even bigger payday. Join us at MyBookie for an entire season filled with daily odd boost, same gate parlays, and huge prize pool contests. Right now, MyBookie has a no-strings-attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. Use the promo code RAVENS on your first deposit of $50 or more, and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly credited to your MyBookie account. That's promo code RAVENS to claim your cash bonus now. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with my bookie. Uh, it was it was a great response from defense in the second half, and like I really thought the Ravens' offense were going to turn it up a little bit. I really think like that safety really that safety that, that, that Lamar booted at the back of the end zone yep. really kind of like you know that was the, that was the only Rams' only points in the sec in the third in the third quarter. You know the, the Ravens' defense pretty much pitched a, they did pitch a shutout in the third quarter. Only points were the ones that their own team gave up, and um, yeah, yeah. So I was I was proud of the way that uh, McDonald and those guys adjusted, and and Matabike even said after the game that their that their biggest adjustment was just getting off. Of the box, you know that, that they wanted to that they wanted to, the, them to hold on to their blocks, and then so they could climb to the, sec, the second level and get Patrick Queen and, and Roquan. And once they stopped doing that, I mean, so that the, the Rams, what well, the Rams had got like eighty-five yards on the ground in the first half, fifty-five yeah. of them, like fifty-two of them, came on the first drive. So I, I thought, um, I thought, the, if anything, I think the Rams kind of did the Ravens a bit of a favor on that first drive, you know? Oh yeah, and, sure and, did. And, yeah, like, like you you run the ball nine straight times and then you pass, pass, pass. I mean, it's a great Roman special. Yeah, that was that was uh, it, it was amazing in terms of of uh, how effective they were running the ball up the field and you've got, you've got it exactly right. That's the way I, I saw it too. Is they were getting guys to level two and they they had a good hat on hat uh, blocking scheme to get somebody on both Queen and Roquan. Queen isn't very good about getting off those blocks ever, really, but still. But uh, but Roquan they they blocked very effectively on that first drive and Kyron Williams. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of respect for him as a running back coming into this game because, you know, he hasn't faced a, a, a defense like the Ravens that, that has a lot of athleticism to it and and Hamilton and whatnot to, to try and stop the run. But uh, he certainly did an excellent job and he lived up to the billing, uh, the hype coming into this game. And uh, uh, I, I give the, Ra- the Rams offensive line a lot of the credit in terms of how some of those plays were blocked because. Uh, yeah, yeah, they were they were uh, came in this game, this game severely shorthanded on offensive line, too. Um, but um, yeah, like, but then again, like that's. When like that, that Shanahan s scheme though, man, they, they they do a great job of fighting the in the, in the deficiencies of the offensive line talent with with schematic and you know in, in game and game plan the way they approach the game the way they want to attack opposing defenses. They know they can't beat you in the trenches, so they're just going to bypass the trenches and go climb straight to your linebackers. Yeah, there you go. I was the Ravens' point of attack offense always dealt with having that first contact come in level two, and Williams did a very good job with yards after contact when he was first touched in level two. He's dragging people and and uh, uh, not getting taken down by the by the first uh, tackler on a lot of plays. Uh, one of three in the red zone for the Ravens in this game. They're now down to sixty two point seven five percent. That's sixth in the NFL. The median has also climbed during the last few weeks up to fifty five point six. So they're really not that much better than average. Somewhat better. Not astoundingly better like they were early the season when they were at eighty um, percent. I think it's still nice that they're eighteen points ahead of where they were last year when they finished at forty four percent. But uh, uh, you know, not not uh, the red zone has not been the big advantage that it seemed to be early in the year. I didn't, I haven't figured that out in terms yeah, of we, how they've been that. since that beginning. Yeah, we all knew that eighty percent wasn't 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 gonna wasn't gonna hold up, and that there was gonna be some regression to the mean. But it's still better than that what what they were doing like this last year, really the past past couple of years when you know really struggled down there in in the red area. I think a big part of it has been their ability to to, to run the ball down there a lot better. I mean, Gus Edwards was like I said that 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 streak that streak that he had of what five or six straight games with a rushing touchdown. You know, that was the, the reason the Mars passing touchdowns are down for the most part this year is because they've been way better running the ball in, in once they get inside the ten. And um, so, so yeah, I, I like to I like to see that some some more. I feel like they kind of got they've kind of gotten away from that a little bit in recent weeks, and just kind of you know return to that. You just kind of get those numbers back up. Yep, would would love to see more rushing in in the red zone. A rushing period. I mean, this was a game where they ran thirty times and passed forty three. 
So it was the first game of the year where they were kind of forced to pass a little more. And if you think about it, the game script, they had them at the end of the first half and then at the end of regulation, passing the ball to get the get the ball down the field and try and score the first half to catch up and the, and the second half to catch up and go ahead in, 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 in terms of the game. But they didn't have the same opportunities to run the football, not as many. And the only place I thought they missed it, maybe a couple opportunities to run the football, like we said, was in the last couple of minutes of the game when they when they had a chance to uh, to burn some clock the last four minutes, I guess. Yeah, game script can sometimes take you out of your game plan, you know, just because the the natural ebbs and flows of how a game comes out. You know, if you're if you're down with not a whole lot of time, you don't really have time to run the ball. Um, or like, but then again, there are times when you need to, you know, get that time off the clock so that you, you know, the the, the defense is pretty much allowing you to run the ball because they're they're banking on them getting the stop down there, and you're banking on you know you being able to get, take time off the clock and score. So it's just it's it's a, it's a delicate balance sometimes. It's just like sometimes when you get when you find yourself in two minute drives or you know four minute four minute drives you know down points you know a lot of times teams are teams are going to lean lean more past and run and then also some of those runs were Lamar scrambles too so they were still called pass plays that ended up being runs no fourth down attempts for the Ravens in this game one of the big ones that that they maybe should have tried was when they gave the the um, ball back to the Rams. They had a fourth and one at their own 37 or so. Mm -hmm. I know the Ben Baldwin bot was saying strongly go for it. It probably was a, a chance they should have taken at that point in the game. And, and in retrospect, it was definitely a chance they should have taken because they gave up the go ahead touchdown even on exactly. the long field. So if they, you know, and and I don't like looking retrospectively at, at things like that. It was just a good opportunity to maintain control of the football, score again, and take a two-score lead. That's the way I look at it, and uh, yeah. it didn't get it done. Yeah, as long as they didn't put Gus Edwards back there and direct snapped it to him, I would have been fine <laughs> with just about just about any other any other play. I mean, just in situations like that, you can't tell me that Lamar Jackson with the ball in his hands is not going to get you a yard as long as you run away from Aaron Donald's side. Just you know, I don't care if you got to roll the pocket and then just have him have a little follow a convoy around the edge. You just need one yard. So um, I, I believe you know they could they could they should have and could have uh, went for it in that situation and more than likely um, picked up the first down. And who knows if they would have ended up punting three plays later, you know? But it was just taking taking more time off the clock and you had the lead. And and even if they had, I mean the the, the Rams were forced to go for a touchdown, and there's not that much difference in forcing them to do that on a short field as opposed to a long field. So if you're if you're going to give them the ball at the 37 yard line there, which which you know if they have an incomplete pass or something or or no gain, that would be the result of that. Um, it's not that terrible. People say, oh my god, that's the worst thing in the world. Well, no, it's really not. You know, you, you gave them a, a little bit better chance to score a touchdown. But since they had to score a touchdown, that's all they were going to accept. And and so you're, you're, you're just increasing that chance slightly. And also at the same time, increasing your chance of scoring points and, and, and building that two score lead you really need um, at that point. All right, let's jump ahead. Let's talk a little bit about Lamar and uh, and how he did in this game. Um I get, I'll start out with a few stats here, and then we can we can talk about like what you see with some of your your uh, observations on this. But the Rams uh, rushed five plus on fourteen occasions. That's thirty one percent of the time. Lamar was only four of thirteen on those plays, but for eighty yards. So there were at least one big play. I think the fifty four yard play might have been in that group. Um, so five point seven yards per play. No sacks on those. With a four man rush, twenty nine plays, two hundred and thirty yards. So seven point nine yards per play. Definitely uh, very good and and you know the, uh, better than than Stafford did for the entire game. They had one sack uh, among those plays, so not bad at all in those terms. With a three man rush, they had two plays for zero yards. That I believe included the interception, so uh, that wasn't wasn't ideal for the Ravens. But uh, uh, just in terms of of the numbers the Rams used, were you surprised they took it kind of? Um, I would not say they took it easy. I say they actually blitzed blitzed Lamar pretty hard, but um, they probably – I'll just leave it open-ended. Is there anything about the numbers that they rushed that surprised you or, or thought, wait, the Rams did the Ravens a favor or they were very effective this way? I thought – I thought they were going to send more like six, seven man pressures as far as maybe trying to overload one side and, you know, get it, get a, get a free rusher on Lamar. I mean, the odds are Lamar's going to make, uh, make, make go ahead. That I said they had three, three, six or seven man pressures for zero yards in the, in that group. That's right. They're all on the five pluses, but, uh, but yeah, they were effective at that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying, I thought they were going to do that on on a higher on a higher clip because you know, like this, uh, the, the Ravens have yes, as much as much progress as they've made on on in that in that sense, especially since you know, Todd Monken has, has has been at the helm of offensive at the offensive coordinator. They've also struggled at times, you know, dealing with that. And that's when some some of Lamar sacks have come this year, where he hasn't really maybe seen the guy coming clean off the edge, and then they kind of got around his legs before he can make a miss. So I was I thought they would have sent more of those, um, but I, then again, I understand. You know, given the secondary that they have, you want as many guys in coverage as you can going against this revamped Ravens wide receiver report. We've seen him all throughout the season, especially as of late. You know, the Odell Beckham, you know, they got mad respect for Odell Beckham over on, on the Rams. Sean McVay probably expressed uh, to, to uh, uh, who's, their, who's their defense coordinator, uh, Morris, or I, f- I forget. But um, uh, I'm pretty sure he, ex- he expressed to them like, "Hey, like you know, like OBJ, like we we've seen this dude, we know this dude, we know what he's capable of, and he's been playing his tail off the whole month of November. So let's not take him lightly. Let's you know, let's give these guys help." And it still wasn't enough, you know, because OBJ was out there beating guys with double moves, filthy double moves, and the pouring down rain. It was it was, it, it was sick. Um, but uh, yeah, there's I was a little surprised they didn't try to heat him up a little bit more, even if it was just you know sending more second level guys. In terms of ample time and space, ball out quick and pressure, I always like to go through this, but but the Ravens had their highest ample time and space rate of the entire year delivered by the offensive line. So that was a big deal. And a lot of it delivered, honestly, by the rain and the slower get-offs by the, by the defensive players. But 20 times Lamar had ample time and space, and he threw for 212 yards on those play, 10.6 yards per play. That's a good number. It's it's on the verge of great Stafford in these conditions only threw for slightly over six yards per play, which was really underperforming in his case, uh, given I thought what the field conditions were. Uh, But Lamar had some had some great open opportunities, made use of them, had some really nice, super extended pockets that uh, he took advantage of. I saw something come out today um, in terms of a chart that indicated that longer pass plays that take longer to develop. Uh, typically go for a lower EPA. But Lamar Jackson bucked the trend by having a lower EPA on faster throws than he did on longer developing plays. And that I don't believe that took, in, took into account runs that accrue off of extended plays, which Lamar would look even better at. But Lamar was, was, was a real outlier in the case of being in the upper left hand of the chart where he got a lot of uh, a high EPA on extended plays and a lower EPA on uh, uh, quick uh, throws that where he's scheming the ball out quickly. Well, yeah, I mean that's been a focus of his you know, focus of his you know throughout this season is just buying his receivers more time to get open downfield. And you got guys like like Zay and, and Odell who can who do a really great job of separating the top of their routes. Them, I mean, why not try to give them you know more time? I mean, there are times there was one like that one that uh, that Lamar had that was Zay was kind of streaking for a while uh, towards the towards the right sideline that he that he, that he just missed. But like I said, the, when you have guys that can separate like that at an, at, a, at a very high level, damn near elite level, you know, like why not? buy them more time if you can yeah i thought I, by the way on that throw you're talking about and, and i jackson kind of grounded the football short of flowers it was relatively early in the game right mm-hmm. that that was a play i thought where flowers really as as in learning to be the extended play target for lamar he's got to give up some of his depth there he's got to really come back hard on the sideline for the football nobody can stay with him so that's going to that's going to put lamar in a position where he can't he doesn't have to ground the football and that is by the way the the the, the golden rule on on rollouts to one side is after your route is run that the the a certain receiver goes to the sideline at one depth you have another uh, on the sideline at another depth um but you've got to come back for the football you've got to you know basically make it easy for your quarterback to make that throw on the run or there's a good chance he's just going to ground it or throw it out of bounds out of out of fear of an interception yeah, that improvement's gonna come with more reps. You know, there's usually a Mark Andrews special right there. You know, he's yeah. he's always always good about coming back and and, and doing that. And we saw that from Odell, Odell Beckham at, at times in this in this game too. So that'll just come with reps. And I mean, I just can't wait to see this connection just further blossom in, in in the years to come. I'm so excited about the Zay Flowers and the Mark connection because they genuinely they don't just generally like each other and, and enjoy each other. They're they're great together, and their chemistry is just gonna continue to grow and as much as i you know I, I miss i miss mark this is a golden opportunity for them to establish even more live in-game chemistry so you're not always relying on 89 you can look hey you know i can trust four and he's down in distances and and um and three two you know Od- odell was doing his thing yeah very good uh eight ball out quicks 18 percent, 40 yards in that game 5.0 yards per play that's a little bit below average for lamar 17 pressures 
That's too much, 38%. Um, the, the Ravens only got 58 net yards on those plays. Aaron Donald had an unbelievable amount of pressure in this game, even though uh, a lot of it was coming between two and a half and three seconds. It's, uh, it's still a very effective pressure. But the three and a half yards per play actually is not terrible for being under pressure. It's about average. Uh, it's just too many pressures for the conditions. So uh, 38% is normally a little too high. 38% for these conditions is much too high in terms of, of what was delivered. So, um, they got a, did a good job of getting ample time and space, but as you'll see, the the offensive line grades are definitely not off the charts from this game because there was a fair amount of pressure given up. It's kind of barbelled results, I, I I guess I would refer to it as. Yeah, um, yeah, they, they they definitely devoted a lot of attention to Aaron Donald, which also kind of freed up some of their other guys to generate some pressure as well, especially their other interior defensive linemen. And um, but then uh, there's only so much you can do before Aaron Donald is going to impact the game. I mean, the guy's a future Hall of Famer for a reason. Yeah. Uh, Hoyt had a big game as well in terms of, of doing some things. I'm sorry, I had Kobe Turner, I meant, um, also from the nose. So uh, Byron Young, uh, uh, you know, is, is a really solid rookie player who did some things in this game uh, against Ronnie Stanley and against Moses in the game. So uh, they ran from three other pressures, four gains, Lamar did. So basically there were three other pressures which could have gone down for negative scores, but they didn't happen. So I docked some adjustments as I went through this game. We'll get into that in the second part of the show. Um, I, I would just say in words to, to quicken this out that Lamar was very slightly better than his opportunity set. I don't think that it gets a you get a great read on that from EPA. I know he had a great EPA game. Um, I think that his his opportunity set was quite good. He did a little bit better than that. You know, when you when you factor in the running, that's an additional positive. When you factor in the interception, that's a negative, obviously. But um, I, I think he did a he did the between a little better and somewhat better than his opportunity set as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, stats don't always tell, tell, tell the story when it comes to Lamar. He's just that unique of a talent. Yeah. Uh, it definitely makes everybody else better. So you've always got that on the field with Lamar. And that's why, you, you know, you, you can't trust a PFF grade to, to fully reflect that. And the, the PFF people are even kind of frustrated that they, they, they know they can't really, um, reflect all that and the grades they have. And they, they keep trying to come up with ways to do it. And they look at missteps by linebackers. They're very creative about trying to find things that might work, particularly out of their R&D team. Uh, but they uh, you know, they still have a lot of trouble, for, for, from my way of thinking, of getting Lamar properly um, ranked among quarterbacks um, via pure rating system and how he's making other players better. All right, the Rams had some real big breakdowns on that left side, uh, which is I think one of the one of the uh, uh, big th- stories of this game is they really had four of them in the game. So three of them in the first half uh, that were likely Beckham and may- maybe Beckham again. I'm trying to remember who who got the third one. Likely Beckham, Beckham. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then the and then the fourth one was captured wonderfully from the the top view on the all 22. So if you've seen it, Mink put it out and other people have have posted it as well. But, um, you know, the great thing about it was Jackson talked about running right at the safety and taking him out of the play in the huddle. Uh, Aguilar, sorry, Aguilar mentioned that. So Mm -hmm. somehow Aguilar, you know, with, 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 the Ravens not managing the clock properly is, is coming up with a play that's going to get the flowers open for the touchdown, you know, to, to, to put them ahead. And he ran right at the, he ran right at that safety that's on the left hash to start. You know, they're in a too high look, drags him with him towards that left sideline by flattening out his route. And sure enough, that, that, that leaves a wide open window for, for uh, uh, Lamar to hit Zay. And after the play, you can see Aguilar go ballistic on the sideline. It's like he had just, he just scored the touchdown himself from the look at it. And, and he, you know, he, he gives this whole spinning fist bump and then it goes right at points, right at the receiver there. And, and you can tell Lamar's story, very, very um, genuine in terms of his time at the podium afterward. Great teammate to have in Nelson Aguilar. He's very down on the possibility of him being good for the Ravens. He's completely exceeded my expectations this year. Mine too, man. I mean, this this time and time again, man. Whether he's catching the ball for clutch for clutch first down and key conversions, or like you said, like helping helping audible a play or adjusting a route or taking it, you know, being is that unselfish leader. Like whether the guy catches five balls or no balls, the dude's impacting the game in a multitude of ways that sometimes goes unseen and underappreciated. But and I appreciate Lamar for highlighting him 
for doing for doing that just because like yeah. that's the kind of stuff that you see like, i'm not you know projecting too far here but that's the kind of stuff that you, that, that you see and when they're when in when they're breaking down the documentaries of super bowl winning season you know when they're like man you remember this one game and then you know and, and then nelly did this nelly did that and we just knew we were just in sync and we just had that feel and like i've just there's been so many moments that, throughout this throughout this year whereas where, where guys like nelson aguilar the guys like older beckham and guys like kyle van and guys like 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 uh jadavian Clowney, you know guys that you know were you weren't really expecting a whole lot from or like too much from. And like they, they just, they just shine in a multitude of ways. And that's, that, that, that's another prime example of that. So I, I love Nelly, man. Like, like when he signed for 1.5, 1. 1. 1. 1.1.5 million. I mean, the guy's a steal. Yeah, he's, he's the, he's, I think he might be 3 million, but whatever the, whatever the price is, the real price of him was the sixth round draft pick, which I was very, I'm always very frustrated when you give up a compensatory pick like that. So you know, he did. He did up costing the six. I'd say what has happened so far this season has been worth it. Um, I and that I, I do not say that lightly because that pick would be really meaningful to the Ravens coming up this year when they need to have a lot of holes to fill. And uh, and you know, it, it it is a it's less than a fifty percent chance probably still to work out as a six round pick. But if it does work out, it can work out with a lot of value for you. So you don't want to lose it. But Aguilar has been worth it this year. He's he's done a lot of real positive things for the Ravens, and he might even be a guy that they would re-sign. Um, I, have I think so, definitely. Yeah. yeah, you might you might you might lose a Beckham, but you can definitely afford to bring back an Aguilar. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that would uh, kind of make sense. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, some of the other scheme on offense that they used. Uh, a little bit of change again in running back snap division, and I think I understand the explanation for it. Hill had thirty snaps in this game to lead all the running backs. Mitchell twenty four, Edwards nineteen. They played three pony snaps during the game, and that included the big 27-yard run by Mitchell, who ran behind the block of Edwards on that play. So Edwards was lined up left sidecar and Edwards right sidecar. And they or uh, uh, yeah, any, anyway, uh, Mitchell followed Edwards for that uh, for that run. Yeah, that's one of one of the favorite plays of the game. Like when when they came out, I was like, "Pony, pony, okay." I, I can't wait to see what they what they do with this. I, I love when you can get your your, your 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 two your two backs on the field, especially because Gus, man. I mean, the dude is basically a, a you know a fullback with a little bit more juice and a little bit better hands. I mean, you get that guy, we get that guy moving. You know, they don't call him Gus the Bus just because he can. He, you know, he can tote the rock, but he can also you know he can also block his butt off too. And like that, most people want to want to gripe about you know keeping Mitchell not getting as many touches. Is, I mean, on that touches, he got, he led the team. He led the backfield touches. We're not going to get as many snaps as 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 Justice as a uh, Justice Hill. Um, except game game script, man. Justice Hill is their most trusted pass blocker when it comes yep. to that kind of when it comes to that kind of stuff. And that's the that's the only reason he barely outsnapped uh, Keaton Mitchell. You know, like I, I would have liked to see them run the ball more, or even just get Keaton Mitchell more involved in the, in the passing game. I mean, the guy picked up eight yards in the first down on, on his first snap of the game, and then you don't throw on the ball the rest of the game. That one yeah. I didn't understand. But you you hit on exactly the reason why they sat him for a lot of snaps is that he he'd given up. And it's, it, Hill is the guy they trust to pass block, and he did a pretty good job. But Mitchell gave up a sack on his first uh, pass blocking attempt of the night, I believe, or, or of the of the day. It felt like night, but <laughs> but he gave up a a um, a sack to fifty three. I want to say uh, Ernest Ernest. Was that was, was that the one that really wasn't a slack because Lamar got the ball out and like he, he kind of like ran through Mitchell a little bit and then got there the were two the of those so there's one that ended up being a quarterback hit I think that I gave a third to Mitchell but there was one that um, he, he actually gave up a Mitchell actually gave up the sack so there's an there's an S zero uh, th- wait my note is 34 too slow stepping up to block 53 and and I don't know if yeah S 53 was the eventual stacker on that so he might have missed him on the initial hit but Lamar got flushed and had no room and he escaped to the line of scrimmage and and it was actually uh I think it's Ernest Jones or Ernest Johnson I'm forgetting his name actually right yeah, now Ernest Ernest Jones yeah yeah who came back and made the made the tackle at the line of scrimmage so uh it, it's a, it's the player who 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 allows the blow up who generally gets the charge in my system not not necessarily the whole thing but probably is is going to get most of it so uh, and then he had another pressure he allowed later in the game so they really needed Hill in there. Hill had a tremendous number of set and chip blocks for this. I know I, I recorded that somewhere in here. Yeah. So the Ravens had as a team 20 set blocks and 14 chip blocks. Now you, you're spreading those out, out over 45 pass plays. So it's 0.76 per play. 
very aggressive trying to help their tackles, trying to make sure people get blocked up. And with the Rams and a lot of the interior blitzing they were doing, they were really having to use a lot of M blocks, M set blocks, meaning uh, between the tackles, that's uh, it'll be M43 under is what we what we have on our score sheet for that, meaning that they blocked in between the tackles uh, uh, is an M. So anyway, Hill had 10 set blocks and three chips of the 20 and 14 that the Ravens threw in total. And you think about that, you know, they have Ricard, they have tight ends, they have what Edwards do. They have the the Mitchell plays that some of them didn't work out, but they had several Mitchell plays. Hill had just a tremendous workhorse day as a pass blocker in this game. Yeah, I mean, we've we've seen it on several occasions. You know, he's 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 been like a devastating chip blocker, especially like if you got if you got a, if you got an edge rusher who's kind of like whooping your tackle's ass on, on on the left or right side. I mean, send, send forty three out there. He's going to level that dude. I mean, he, he steps up, he stands strong, and he's 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 an undersized guy, somewhat undersized guy himself. But like I said, he's he's by far the best pass blocking back. Yeah, so even even I mean, using anytime there's a set set block, he I mean, he didn't go out for a for a pass, but they did not. Actually, he did target Hill twice. He had one catch for one catch for twelve yards, but I mean, basically, even though he's in for a ton of pass snaps among those those um, thirty that he played in total, uh, he he took himself out of the play as a receiver, you know, thirteen times effectively with his um, with his set and chip blocking. So he's he's really a uh, um, I won't call it unsel- unselfish because that's that's his job. Okay, so you know, we don't talk about it in in that respect. But uh, he didn't have a chance to have the receiving impact he did because of his his blocking assignments. Yeah, but you know that, that uh, as much as you know, like, that kind of sucks that he didn't get a chance to you know touch touch the ball more. The fact that you know you have a guy like say the Ravens are trending to this, their special teams guys also having roles on offense and defense. Like that's it's, it's a great thing to have a guy who's not exclusively a gunner. Like oh, he's the league's best gunner, and that's it. You know, it's great yeah. to have you know be the league's best gunner and be an excellent pass protector. Who oh yeah, contribute who could also contribute in in the receiving game out of the backfield when given the opportunity. So that's, I, I love Dustin's Hill. I'm glad the Ravens got him for two more years. Well, yeah, that's the, that's the Ravens way right there is to get great special teams player who can, players who can also give you something on offense or defense. And they've done, they, I mean, Tylen Wallace, look, they, it just happened again here. <laughs> now, admittedly, he, he, he has not really done very much on offense. He did get five snaps on offense in this game, but he hasn't really done much on offense. He, he ended up being a great special teams player, came through with the biggest play of the game, but, but uh, uh, you know, it's, it's Hill, it's, uh, Malik Harrison and what he does for you. It's it's players like Anthony Levine in the past. If you want, if you want to go back, it's it's Geno Stone, um, Chuck Clark, Chuck Clark, very much so. You know, he he, he Sean Elliott, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all guys who who could do it. And McClendon, all, lots of guys going back in the history of the Ravens. Uh, I I loved your reaction to the pony backfield there because. I get the same kind of – my voice increases about an octave as soon as yep. I see the ponies. Oh, pony, pony backfield. Pony, <laughs> pony, it's, pony. It's, it's very exciting when it, when it happens. And, you know, it's, it's it just – you. it's it's kind of like being – when the, the pony is so unusual in terms of what the Ravens run. And we don't – we still haven't seen all of the little uh, nuances to Monken's offense even yet after, after you know, 13 games. Um, that you, you know you might see something for the first time kind of like when you're when you're 10 or 11 years old watching football and you, and you you don't know all the all the tricks that offenses try and run so uh, I still think there's a great RPO to be had somewhere where Edwards is a lead blocker in on a, a play like that Mitchell gets the ball in the mesh but it gets taken away from and then thrown to some other part of the field and I would just love to see you know the Ravens take advantage of something like that with all of the traffic that would be created uh by having Edwards lead Mitchell on a typical run left say out of that yeah, I mean, you, you see the Niners do that kind of stuff to an, to an extent, and like even though they have a le- way less, you know, uh, um, electric quarterback, you know, like the Brock Purdy, um, but it's, it's just like that seeing that kind of creativity to keep to further keep defenses off balance to give them another thing they have to be aware of. It just it just opens up the def- it opens up opens up the rest of the field even more for the rest of your playmakers, whether it be in the passing game or the run game. I want to talk a little bit about the use of Patrick Ricard. Actually, save that for the second half of the show because we'll do some individual thing. And Ricard is is a guy I definitely want to want to hit on here. Uh, just overall, I want to hit on one more thing before we break. Here is is that the various Ravens receivers are now just starting to show a little bit of the um, replace Mark Andrews kind of feel, and it's it's definitely a by committee approach. 
but we've seen the last two weeks likely catch nine of 13 targets for 123. He's probably been the best of anybody with 9.5 yards per target. A lot of it was on this throw after the catch this week, getting open on a busted coverage down the left sideline. But last week he had 44 yards of yak and 40 yards of receiving. So his average catch was behind the line of scrimmage. Um, Beckham, 7 of 15, caught for 131. Beckham hasn't been a high catch percentage, by the way. I know Beckham's um, yards per reception is high. You really want to look at yards per target, which is still good for Beckham this year uh, to be his value. But he's sixth in the league in yards per reception. I think a lot of people are are really getting on that. Uh, 8.7 yards per target the last couple of games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Lamar is definitely looking for him beyond beyond the sticks, and like I said, a lot of times he's coming up with those with those catches. And like he, it's, it's almost like he takes a, I won't say mandatory, but like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna try these guys deep with Beckham at least once, you know, and, and once twice in the first half he does that with, with Beckham and Bateman, and it's just like as much as yeah, as much as they you know like they like clicked on some of those plays, you know, in, in this game, I mean that. It feels like every week the Ravens are still leaving some meat on the bone with a deep passing oh, yeah. game. And it's like once that thing is clicking on all, I'm not even saying on all cylinders, just a couple more cylinders. I'm telling you, man. I mean, this you're gonna be you're gonna be beating teams by by by, by double figures instead of you know by the skin of your teeth sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I I would agree, and I, I really want to see some of that. Flowers has been the one guy that's been a little bit disappointing in terms of usage the last couple of weeks. Now they look. I'll take all of that. I'll throw all that out the window for the one touchdown pass the Ravens needed to have and the one two-point conversion they really needed to have right after that, which was which was both Zay. But uh, he's had 16 targets the last two weeks for only 85 yards. It's 5.3. A lot of that is just limited A dot. And there's honestly, there's no reason for it in a place like when you're playing in LA. When, and, but, but I guess the reason for it was Khalil Mack really was was getting into the backfield quicker. A game like this, I don't see you ever having a better opportunity to get the ball down the field than you did here. I mean, the pass rush was taking forever to get home. Lamar had tons of extended plays. You know, Zay Flowers is is not the route runner that most of the other guys are, but he sh- certainly is a sudden athlete who can create a lot of separation at some point during a play uh, to uh, uh, to make himself available. Uh, and then you see some things happen, like what did on the sideline, the, the play you talked earlier about it, which, which probably is one of the ones that held down his receiving total in this game a little bit. Yeah, and then, then a lot of it is a lot of times was, it was him kind of sitting down at the sticks and finding those soft spots in his own coverage so he could get the get the first down. So they're, they're, some of it's situational, like, you know, you really want somebody to just, like, you know, get the ball, get down, or get the ball and get, get the get the first down. And sometimes that guy, that guy is Zay, which kind of like the, lowers his average at the target sometimes. I thought Flowers was the one guy on that four-minute drive who was getting those very high-productive first down pretty much barely and get down to the ground, get tackled, and then let that clock run down a little bit. Uh, he was the one guy who was doing that. Everybody else, you know, they're running out of bounds. They were, <laughs> they were incomplete passes in a lot of cases and and whatnot. But that, that was a great drive for Flowers all, all the way down the field, uh, what he did. Yeah, I mean, the whole fourth quarter, like what, four of his four of his six, uh, four of his six catches came in the fourth quarter, 45 yards in, in, in the touchdown. So, um, yeah, the guy was like he struggled with drops a little bit, you know, in the first half, but he really responded there when the Ravens needed him most. Yeah. Uh, I think they, we'll call it there on the first half. We got some other things we can talk about in terms of the individual receivers and Ricard and whatnot in the second half of the show. But, Josh, always a pleasure to talk football with you. It's always an exciting conversation. It's a very high energy level, a lot of rabbit holes, a lot of, lot of fun discussion. But tell folks where they can uh, talk football with you online and find your work. Well, yeah, you can hit me up on Twitter at, at Josh Reed nine zero seven. Um, that's that's my that's my Twitter handle. I think it's like Josh Reed uh, twenty seven on, on Instagram, but I'm I'm barely on there. Only only thing I go on Instagram for is to watch funny videos. But you can read all, all my Ravens content at BaltimoreBeatdown dot com, and um, I'm also a full time sports reporter as Kid mentioned for Anchor Daily News up here at Anchor Alaska. All right. Outstanding. Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. DMs are always open on Twitter. Really appreciate you fans uh, sticking with us the whole season. Uh, listens are really nice and really appreciate the, the loyalty people have to this show. Uh, thanks for that. And uh, thanks for all the nice things you have to say out on Twitter and whatnot. Uh, the one thing we would ask if you're listening to the show after an hour and five minutes here is that maybe you could go out and write a review uh, if you could do if you even do that once per season and give a nice five-star review that has real value to us and, uh, and helps the search engine um, introduce new people to film study content, which really appreciate it. Also want to encourage fans to use uh, 
um, hashtag film study mailbag to ask questions. We're going to get to some of that in the show. We're trying to, to see if there might be value to adding a question show immediately after the game, meaning the night of the game to get a quicker response thing. It would probably be just me doing that after the game, but I would love to hear from you if you have an interest in asking questions uh, at, at that point. But anyway, give a, give a Monday morning show to, to, to put out uh, uh, there where I'm normally dark on, on Monday morning. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for listening. Uh, Josh, thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having me. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study. <laughs>